or this week's lecture is going to be on roof styles and construction. So I'm going to go through those roof styles right now, or roof types. So on this page are um, some of the more common roof types we see in this area, the gable and the gambrel. The gable roof is probably the most common for residential construction. Um, it's a, a roof that consists of two separate slopes on either side of usually a center ridge. Um, we'll see some examples of a gable style roof that has a non-center ridge uh, in a minute here, but this is the most traditional. And we're seeing here an example of a cape. Um, uh, Gambrel is got two slopes on each side of the center ridge. So you have a really steep slope at the bottom and then a much shallower slope at the top. And this edge that it's creating here is called a purlin. Um, and it's the transition from one slope to the other. Uh, so this is a sketch of a traditional um, gambrel roof. It was modified from a barn style roof. Um, and the advantage of a gambrel roof as opposed to a, a gable roof is um, the second floor living area. We have much more room on the second floor. Those knee walls get pushed out a lot closer to the outside and closer to the actual exterior walls on a gambrel, whereas on a cape, those knee walls are quite a bit further in. On this slide, we see um, I put these two together because they're kind of, you know, you get a flat roof that is um, most commonly used in commercial construction. And then we have um, a butterfly roof. And I took a picture of North uh, 43 Bistro from the internet to show a butterfly roof that's right in the area of the um, um, our building that we have our classes in. You look across the marina and that's a butterfly roof. The advantages of a butterfly roof um, are that um, you can collect water in the center or um, in this case, I think it's really ge generally being used for um, the, the views are all this way and uh, it's creating a contemporary look. But um, in the crux of where the roof, two roofs, the reverse slopes meet, we either have to slope it in one direction or the other so that rain drains off of the roof or you have to have um, a roof drain system. Flat roofs also are never actually flat. They usually slope in one direction or another ever so slightly so that you can drain um, the moisture off of the roof. Um, in especially in areas that have, have a lot of heavy rain and snow. Um, this is a, a very contemporary um, house style based off of the Savoy uh, house um, that was uh, uh, considered by, uh, I think it's Mies van der Rohe. I might not have that the right person there, but anyway, we um, this is a uh, uh, more often seen in contemporary construction, the flat roof construction. And usually um, a flat roof is a built up roof. So you have uh, the, the structural layer, then you have an insulation layer, and then you have a um, membrane layer. And then on top of that, you have what's called EPDM. That is a uh, bituminous um, rock and asphalt combination that gets put on and kind of um, glued onto the top of the membrane at the end. Mansard roofs are roofs that slope in two directions or uh, two times on all four sides. So you, it's creating a hip roof at the bottom with another little cap of a hip roof at, a to at the top. Think about it that way. It's a, a double sloped hip, which creates a mansard roof. A lot of times with mansard roof from the street view, you can't see the peak of the roof because it's pretty shallow. Sometimes this is flat and um, um, in our area, anyway, uh, some of the old ship captains' homes were designed like this with a widow's walk at the top that was actually functional. You could get up there and you could um, go up to the widow's walk. It's called a widow's walk because the ship captains' wives would go up there to look for their husband's ships, and sometimes they didn't come back. So um, this is an example of a mansard roof here with some dormers, and um, it has a very distinct look. It's more often seen with Victorian or Second Empire Napoleonic era um, design. A jerkin head roof is a little piece of hip 
being put on the end that would normally be the gable. And it's mostly for looks, um, but what it does do is um, increases that wall area here on this side that we can um, add a window to. This is a hip roof, a hip roof like this, um, doesn't really allow you to put any windows on that side on the second floor. So if this does have second floor living like this example does, then we might want to add, be able to add um, some windows on the gable side, um, but still have kind of that hip roof look. So the jerkin head does that. Um, again, I'm not sure what the function of it would be. It's more of a style. It kind of has a Dutch style to it. These are pretty common um, hip roof construction. So you've got cross hip. All that means is two hip roofs that are intersecting each other. Um, and then a pyramid hip it happens when you've got the same width to um, length ratio for uh, the footprint of the house. It's going to naturally create a pyramid if we're sloping the four sides at the same slope on all four sides. So the house will have a peak right at the middle. Um, but uh, these two are just examples of uh, vari uh, variations of hip roof style. This is called a combination roof because we have kind of a reverse um, to what's happening with the mansard roof. If we go back a little bit, the mansard roof has a super steep slope at the base, creating um, more of a, a slightly off from vertical surface that we could put dormers on like this to create more light and um, ventilation on that second floor and then a much shallower top whereas the combination roof has a much shallower base and then it has um, either a hip it has a hip on the top so this is these are the two variations really you have a hip at the top or you could have a dutch gable where this instead of being hipped here as well has got a little um, gable end here that you could put a vent in or you could put additional windows in for lighting um, i think this combination roof sort of looks like the pizza hut roof so that's why i put that in there and then here's an example of a dutch gable that i think is looking quite asian in this picture very um uh, Asian inspired, uh, but this is a uh, got that little um, gable here that is designed into the um, uh, the roof system. Usually, like I said, for ventilation, but I think in this case it's being used for style. A hexagonal gazebo. Um, I don't know why this is falling under a particular roof type because basically this is a hip roof, but with multiple sides, not just four sides. So we could have an octagonal variation. You could have, you know, as many sides as you might want. Um, and then you see this kind of roof structure a lot in Victorian. So here's a turret right here that has one, two, three, four sides showing on one side because it's kind of attached to the rest. This would be an octagonal example. Um, but we're not seeing the other the other um, uh, two sides that are attached to the house. Um, this goes along very nicely with this asymmetrical style of the Victorian. And here's a salt box, which is basically a variation of a gable um, where the ridge is not necessarily centered. And the advantage of a salt box and the reason why it was so popular in the New England era is that it um, heated very well. It had um, a really good layout for um, the colonial uh, natural heating that you had to have either through a wood uh, fireplace. You notice the fireplace is centrally located in this very traditional salt box. And then also if this side of the house was facing south, you had a potential for a lot more natural solar gain into your space. Um, and it was very important for those New Englanders to keep themselves warm in our harsh winters. And so salt boxes did a very good job of doing that. And then having a back wall here that's much lower um, reduces the amount of heating space that needed to be heated um, in the in the uh, in the winters. And it's called a salt box because in the old, you know, um, grocery stores, uh, a lot of the dry goods were sold in boxes that look very similar to this where you had scoops, you open the lid, you'd scoop out what you needed for salt rather than buying salt or flour or sugar um, in pre-packaged um, pre bags. Continuing with roof uh, types, we have a shed, which is probably the most economical and most um, um, uh, has the most potential for um, a residential construction uh, as far as uh, providing um, 
lots of light, um, good opportunities for solar gain, and um, a really easy roof system to maintain. So there's an example here where there's a double roof, a double shed um, with a row of clear story windows up here, providing some extra light into this probably open, uh, completely open ceiling um, up to that roof system so we can see those lights. Included too is this M-shaped roof, which I haven't seen very often, but here's an example of it. This is a um, Gothic Revival Victorian. You can tell that from the gingerbread trim that's showing up at the uh, at the edges of the roof here. And um, uh, this is awfully quaint. It's very farm style. But what's wrong with a um, M style shaped roof in our area is that that would collect a lot of snow and be problematic um, with uh, drainage. So we don't really see this type of uh, roof system much in our area. So some roof terminology, and I'm going to uh, jump to the actual book here too, but these are some basics. This is uh, the framing, what the framing looks like. The rafters frame into the ridge board. And um, if the um, if we want to have a, an overhang on the soffit side, that's really easy to do. You just extend the rafters past the wall, the uh, uh, projection or the offset that you want your soffit. And then uh, if you wanted a rake side overhang, you have to use the, what are these are called lookouts and that uh, rafter that we could put on the side that's kind of dangling and being held out by those lookouts is called either the fly or barge rafter. So let's go to the book and see um, some examples of um, Give it a second to refresh the page here. All right, so um, if we go to the section on roofs. Um, see if I can get myself out of the way here. Roof systems, there we go. And in particular, we want to go to um, wood rafters and framing. This is the anatomy of a roof system here that's from your book. So what I like about this picture is it shows the full system. Here's the top, two top plates for the top of the wall. You can see this is called the bird's mouth cut right here. This is a seat cut and a plum cut that we cut at the bottom of the rafter. So it's got a little notch there to make it sit very nicely on the top of the wall. And these rafters frame into a ridge beam. Um, and uh, here's some examples of some openings for either a skylight or a dormer. And this is also another example of how those lookouts could be built. So see how uh, these two rafters are doubled up and they're holding up the weight basically and these lookouts are resting on top of the gable end wall to allow that fly or barge rafter to hang out past the edge of the wall and create a rake overhang. See if there are other terms up here. So there's here's some great terms here for all the different pieces and parts of the roof. Even though this is, um, uh, looks like it's light gauge um, steel construction, it doesn't make any difference. The names are the same. You've got a, a ridge board, uh, anything going perpendicular to the direction of the um, framing members are, are almost always called headers, and that's the case here too. Um, this is a, a valley jack right here because it's creating a valley between the main roof and the dormer. A dormer is any kind of pro a projection from the roof that's creating. Usually you put in a dormer to add a window or some ventilation. Um, and uh, the same things are called out on a dormer. This would be a rafter. This would be the ridge beam of the dormer. Um, and we get um, double header at the bottom of the opening. So this opening right here is the entire opening that had to be made for this uh, dormer. And then these pieces here on either side to fill in the holes around the dormer are cripples. Um, or valley jacks in this case, it looks like. 
and um, these are uh, tail rafters down here they're calling them but those are can also be called cripples and we've got um, an example of a shed roof over here a shed dormer I should say um, you've got gable side of the shed dormer the front where the windows are being framed and in this case the um, the dormer wall the front dormer wall is aligning with the exterior wall on uh, below it and then we can see our floor system um, framing next to all of the uh, all of the studs in the dormer um, everything else common rafter floor joists everything else is called out the same uh, when we get into um, talking about thermal and moisture protection, I will do that as a separate um, uh, lecture. Um, we'll talk about ventilating a roof. And so this is an illustration of insulation in a roof system in that um, we're keeping a two inch airspace to allow for ventilation to move from the soffit vent up to the ridge vent in a roof system. So this is an example of what a um, ridge vent might look like. It's a metal ridge vent actually. Can have gable vents. Gable vents are, we can see from the outside usually too, um, and they show up above the um, envelope of insulation and allow the roof to breathe that way. This is called a collar tie, and it ties um, the two rafters together kind of at uh, usually it wants to be at around two thirds the height of the rafter. Um, whatever that two-thirds point is is a good spot to put the collar tie and then the base of the rafters are tied to the top of the foundation or top of the uh, uh, framed wall rather um, and this is an illustration of how um, the ceiling joists and the rafters could be strapped and nailed together or they could be um, uh, basically uh, screwed or nailed or bolted together with uh, um, framing anchors and you got some additional illustrations on how that bird's mouth can be cut into the rafter um, and resting directly on top of um, the wall or we could move that uh, uh, rafter up and move it up to um, the base of the second floor which is something you might see in a Cape Cod kind of application where the knee wall would be over here and we've got the rafter resting on top of the uh, subfloor um, moving that whole roof system up a little bit and providing more room for trim and whatnot on the exterior wall. And these are illustrations on the different ways that you can enclose the ends of the roof. So um, this is a this is a roof system where the rafters would be exposed if you walked around and walked underneath your house and you looked up and you could see every rafter that's an exposed rafter system. And with that type of system we need to enclose in between each rafter and provide some vent holes which is what we have here um, blocking with screened vent holes and screened so that um, bugs and other kinds of small critters can't get in but the ventilation here is doing the same thing as the ventilation we talked about above where it's providing ventilation from outside through the roof and either above all the insulation in the ceiling or it's following a path along the top edge of the um, rafter up to a ridge vent and this just shows different illustrations with how we could cut the ends of the rafters in a decorative way and show it. On this side we have what's called a closed cornice um, a detail for a finished roof detail and this includes a, a soffit and fascia. And the soffit and fascia um, uh, can have many layers depending on how uh, finely trimmed we want it to be. But this is showing a um, soffit with a vent strip. This is a lookout that allows us to have some additional nailing points for the soffit. And then we have our um, header out here that's uh, acting as a header for all the ends of the rafters. And then the fascia is being placed as a um, finished piece on the outside uh, of that header. So this closed cornice detailing um, is, is uh, showing you the anatomy here. We're gonna see what that looks like in section when I show you a detail. And this is an interesting section because it does show what's called the rake overhang. And so this is if we wanted to follow this soffit all the way up along the slope of the roof as it moves up underneath the rake of the, the roof um, and what we would see for um, 
um, framing members and uh, decorative trim in section. And this is an example here of a much narrower overhang. So we have a soffit overhang over here and a rake overhang over here. A lot of times a rake overhang hang is very narrow like this because where we want to pull the um, the uh, the roof away from the wall is on the side that it sheds most of the rain, water, and snow. Um, and so by putting in an overhang, you're protecting your wall um, by shedding that water out here and having it drip a certain distance away from the wall. So uh, you do see in some areas where there's no overhang on the soffit side either, but usually um, those work well as long as that wall is facing south. If it's facing north, it can tend to have a lot of mold growing on it. Um, and as we go a little bit further, you're seeing some examples of different uh, uh, roof systems. This one's a flat roof system with a parapet roof in front and so on. Most importantly, though, I want you to understand some of the terms that we're seeing here and, uh, you know, what are the differences between these construction methods. So let's go back to our roof system. So another way for us to frame our roof is instead of with, um, you know, traditional rafters is we can uh, we can ov obviously use trusses. Uh, trusses are um, advantage of a truss is they span much longer distances. They're prefabricated in a protected shop and they can be quickly installed. The disadvantages is that um, you usually can't install these as a single person or even a crew of two. Um, roof trusses tend to be extremely heavy and they need to be picked up by a crane and placed in, in the location. So we have to uh, rent or borrow or bring in heavy equipment to place the trusses, but it's usually done very quickly. This is some additional dimensions that show like different configurations for trusses. This is a W truss and aptly named, it looks like a W. This is a king post because there's a center post holding up the center of the ridge of the truss. And this is a scissor truss that has also a king post. Um, and these dimensions that are shown here and these uh, spacing options are you, the uh, kind of standard for these different types of truss systems. And then over here, it gives you some charts as to how long these particular types of truss can span. All three of these are sh that are shown are called bottom cord um, uh, trusses in that they rest this bottom cord. This is the bottom cord. These are the top cords of the trusses and the bottom cord of the truss is what's resting on the structural member like a wall system. All right, with roofs, we have a lot of different pitches that we've got to deal with too. Um, a pitch, a roof pitch is um, the rise to run ratio. And the run is always 12 or one foot and the rise can vary. So very, very low sloped roofs, something at below 312 pitch, flat to 312 pitch, um, are uh, shallow, shallow roof systems that must have either rolled or continuous membrane roofing. S shingles um, and sheet material are, are not a good idea for low slope roofs because the, um, if especially here in Maine, because of uh, uh, we get a lot of snow and then rain and snow and then melting and then snow and then melting in the winter, and those can call cause ice dams. And that ice can crawl up those that roof system if it's not shedding properly off of the roof. Um, and so it defeats the purpose really of, um, of naturally shedding only in one direction. Uh, low slope roof with shingles, you, you have run the potential of that water moving up, uh, up underneath the shingles very, very easily. Medium sloped shingles or medium slope to high sloped roofs can use shingles, tiles, or sheet material. Um, and the material that you use uh, varies depending on a lot of things, sometimes by looks, sometimes by durability, sometimes, um, yeah, I guess those are the two things. So we've got an example here of an A-frame structure. An A-frame structure uh, usually has a much higher run value to a uh, uh, riser value, but rather to run value. So this is for, this is probably like a, 18, 12 pitch or 24, 12 pitch because of its super high peak. These A-frame structures do very well, obviously, in northern climates where there's a lot of snow, shed snow. And on top of that, this is a standing seam metal roof, which is going to shed sh uh, snow really, really well. Um, so those are the uh, 
pitches basically show you how shallow a pitch can get and then how steep. Um, as an example, this pit, uh, the pitch can be com compared to 1812 to a 112 pitch is a big difference. This is a, an example of a, a cornice roof detail. It's cornice because it's completely enclosing the rafters. We have a soffit here with a soffit vent in a fascia. Um, and this is an older detail, so it has a lot of callouts to it that uh, um, are no longer applicable for, as far as the insulation values go. So ignore the insulation values, but do pay attention to what's here for structural elements and um, finishes. So we've got, you probably recognize the full uh, wall system here, two top plates, insulation, gypsum wallboard in the inside, plywood on the outside, and we'd see a row of um, siding on the outside as well. This little two by is a um, nailer. If, if, uh, if the soffit is um, uh, not really touching a whole lot of the surface of the rafter, then we need to put a nailer in here to nail the soffit here and then to the uh, seat cut of the rafter on the outside. This um, vent needs to be as close to the outside edge of the soffit as possible so that as the air gets pulled into this soffit here, it can circulate and move up in between the insulation and the bottom of the and the top of the rafter and then circulate up here and then go out usually a ridge vent or a gable vent. So this area up here would be ventilated. This is our insulation that's enclosing the living space. We want to make sure that insulation is always overlapping the top of wall like it's showing here. And this just gives you an idea of the types of um, pieces and parts that we have in this section so you can see what's being called out. This is a detail of a, game, a, ga, a gambrel roof. So, you, But a gambrel roofs can be built in a couple of different ways. In this example, um, this whole roof rafter and wall system would be built at once and raised as if it was a angled wall system like this. This is a 60-12 pitch, so it's super steep. And then the actual roof rafter system would be built on top of that at a much um, shallower pitch of 812, which is still a pretty decent pitch. With this type of gambrel roof, you usually see um, a little piece of fascia between these two different pitches, and this is an area where the roof can be ventilated. Um, so this is an example of a gable vent. This would work because I can bring in uh, air here, have it come in, circulate, and then vent out of the two gable ends. If the gable uh, vent wasn't there, then I could make this a ridge vent up here. And a ridge vent looks like um, shingle from the outside, but then underneath it, there's a little foamy piece that allows for air to come in, but no other things to come in and, and uh, blow in and out. Uh, usually the air is blowing out of the roof in a ridge vent, not in. So this is an example of a really bad detail because what we have is the gable vent inside the area of insulation. So you're basically insulating your roof for no reason at all because you're providing a big open gaping hole here that is your gable vent. And this gable vent should be on the outside of the insulation, not inside it like this. So this detail I want you to show to um, show you what uh, the uh, section cornice detail of a, a, a cape or one and a half story um, house would look like. And all this stuff looks the same. You can see we have the introduction of a knee wall here. And that knee wall will usually be positioned at somewhere around four to five feet tall. And then from there over is your living space. And we can often use this space here for some creative storage. So notice where the insulation is going. It's going up the wall. It's going across the floor here. And then it stops because this area here is the actual inside of the house where we want some um, uh, cross ventilation or some um, opportunity for heat to rise from the first floor up to the second floor. But here we don't want to have that happen because where would the heat go? Right outside would be heating the outdoors. And then we see the insulation going up the wall here and then picking up again at the rafters. Here's our two inch air space. So in this example, air is being pulled in the soffit. It's moving around in this eave storage and then it's going up and out. Um, the uh, up, up along the rafter and out the ridge vent. So this would be uninsulated eaves storage. Here's an example of um, moving that knee wall out to the exterior so that what that does is it increases your amount of living space you have on the second floor. 
Um, and this is a good example too, where we could have used balloon framing instead of making these two separate platforms. And this illustrates um, how much more headroom we get when we change either the pitch of the roof or the width of the house. Um, so this is showing uh, a 10-12 pitch here and a 12-12 pitch here. So in the 10-12 pitch, the amount of ceiling area that we have here is um, very narrow. And uh, if that width right there is less uh, than 50% of the floor area we have here, then this cannot be considered living space. It can't be sold as part of your house square footage. Um, and you can see what happens when we change that to a 12-12 pitch, that ceiling area that becomes the at least seven foot wide ceiling area goes this wide. And we also get to push our knee walls out a little further. So that width here compared to the floor area, we can tell just by looking at it, it's way more than 50% of that floor area. So um, we can definitely count that as living space there on the second floor. And usually we see 10, 12 and 12, 12 pitches for Cape style or one and a half story style houses because of this to get this headroom. And it's a very economical way to add extra square footage to the house. All right, so here's a, an example problem I have for you. Let's pretend we have a house that's 24 feet by 30 feet. What would the rafter depth spacing be for uh, that, the rafters if we had a 50 pound snow load with a seven pound dead load? So I have here an illustration of um, how we come up with what the run of the house would be. The distance, basically if half the width of the house is the run, if we're designing a center ridge beam. So a center ridge beam, um, the run is only from the center of that ridge beam to the outside edge of the, the building line or the rafter span. They're showing from the inside, which you can technically do. I just make it easy and take the 24 feet and say, all right, I know I'm running 12 feet and uh, work it out from there. So I'm going to show you how I'd use the American Wood Calculator, American Wood Council uh, Span Calculator to calculate that problem. The first thing I'm going to do is pick a species of wood that we typically use in this area. And in class, we've been using spruce pine fir. And then I'm going to pick, I'm going to guess that a 2 by 10 might work. I'm going to set the grade to a number 2. And I'm going to change the member type from a floor joist to a rafter with snow load. Now, in our area in Maine, I believe our snow load in this area is 50 pounds snow load, but you can notice we can type that in. So if we're up in Aroostook County, I think you're looking at about a 60 to 70 pound snow load that you'd want to calculate in that area. And then because um, we're dealing with this as a roof system, the roof um, dead load can be brought down to seven because it's there's nothing else. There's nothing else the roof is carrying. It's only carrying really the snow load and the weight of itself. And it's just uh, two, by t uh, two by 10 rafters at 24. So I think that's an appropriate dead load. What we're looking for when we hit calculate maximum horizontal span is we're looking for something that's 12 feet or longer. When we do that, we get 12 feet, seven inches. And so I found a solution that works. If I wanted to see how close I could get to the 12 feet, maybe I want to change uh, this two by 10 to, um, a two by eight and calculate it. And that can only span 10 feet at the 24 inches on center. So I think we did find the best choice a two by 10 at uh, um, 24 inches on center is a good, good choice for this with seven inches to spare for span distance. Um, so two by tens at 24 inches on center, spruce pine fir number two can span up to 12 foot seven and the ridge board then should be a two by 12. Um, the other things that I wanted to go over today is um, some house styles. So I have a link to some house styles that I've um, taken pictures of over the years in the area. And I just wanna point out some things for the roof styles and the house styles that we're gonna be looking at. Um, let's look at bungalows for instance. In this area of South Portland, there's a lot of bungalow construction that was um, what uh, bungalow construction started in this craftsman style era. And um, 
the real catalyst for it was the Sears catalog homes. It was the first type of home besides a colonial cape or ranch that was being designed and it had a lot more architectural detail and craftsmanship, hence being called the craftsman style home. So this is an example of a bungalow and um, what kind of roof system we're seeing here is a hip roof and then we're seeing a jerkin head dormer. Um, and then we are able to see the exposed rafters. So this is a hip roof bungalow with a hip dormer, and this is a corniced roof in that um, the roof system is completely enclosed fascia and soffit. This looks a lot heavier. Um, it has a more substantial look to the roof system, um, and that's why these columns are important that these columns are proportioned correctly uh, to make it seem like it, these columns are significant enough to hold up all of this um, trim detail. This house isn't far from the campus. It's up um, Pillsbury Avenue on the way to Cottage Road if you're taking the back way off campus. Um, and this is a craftsman style home with a very wide overhang of about one and a half um, feet, I think, uh, hip roof. Um, and you've got a lot of interesting architectural detail and custom, um, custom crafted windows and doors for this house. And then there's another example of a bungalow. Looks very similar to the second one, but notice the difference in the dormers. We have a hip dormer on the front, which I believe might have been an original dormer. We have a shed dormer on the side, which I believe might have been added later on uh, for second floor expanded living space. And we look at the size and the amount of trim detail up here and the size of these columns, it's a different proportion than the, the second one that we had here. Get square columns, much beefier, fewer of them, and there's a lot heavier um, cornicing up here. So what I wanna encourage you to do is take a look at these different building styles and start making some connections to the types of roof systems that we typically see for those styles. So like capes and colonials, we often see them with gable uh, roofs. And this is an example of a cape with a um, shed or dustpan dormer in the back and then two doghouse dormers in the front, both um, adding a lot more space on that second floor and adding a lot more light and ventilation on that second floor um, cape. There's a uh, cape as well, but it just has a three-quarter dustpan dormer on the back and no dormers on the front. And if we take a look at some colonials, we'll see some varieties of colonials in here. Oh, I jumped out too far. So these are located in our class folder. Resources, and it's under building styles. So under colonials, um, if you drive around the area near SMCC, you might see a lot of houses that look like this. This is called a four square colonial. I live in a house like this one, um, and that's got a hip roof um, because the squareness of the house is is a uh, works nicely with a hip roof construction. These are called Dutch colonials. So this trim that we're seeing on the outside that looks like a gambrel is really decorative. These two shed dormers on either side are actually expanding that second floor living space so you don't lose any uh, square footage at all on the second floor. But the trim is being kept there to kind of um, see, the, um, see that original gambrel style. Um, but these, I think, were built purposefully this way uh, with that trim. So these Dutch colonials, you can see a, a row of them here on this street. This is a, um, one of the houses that uh, was being sold in the um, Sears catalog called the Hudson, and it is a four square colonial. And this just gives you an idea with the footprint and layout of uh, first and second floor of a four square colonial. There's another one. This one, I think, is a Sears catalog home that is right on Highland Avenue in South Portland. Um, 
uh, between um, the uh, Route 77 intersection and Hinkley Park. You would see this if you were driving uh, south, you would see this on your left. This is called a garrison. Um, and you see this little lip that's uh, second floor is hanging out a little uh, wider than the first. It's a variation of a type of colonial. But the second floor is wider than the first. And it actually uh, came from a garrison fort. The style idea came from that where the garrison fort was functional in that this overhang was quite a bit wider and it made it very difficult uh, for anybody to attack the fort because the forts was wider at the top and then at the bottom. So uh, climbing the walls and trying to get into that second floor was a lot more difficult. Well, that overhang became more of a decorative look and but it still uh, ended up being called a garrison. Um, a, uh, named after the garrison forts. There's a salt box. So you have a two-story structure on one side and a one-story structure on the other. And usually the ridge, um, well, it can be centered. This one does look like it's centered actually, but you know, you've got a much shallower pitch on one side and a much steeper pitch on the other. So I'll let you go through the rest of these as a uh, some exam. You know, it's interesting to go through them. I also have included some traditional, um, you know, Art Deco, Beaux Arts. Um, what else? Um, Second Empire. So a Victorian style uh, homes and buildings and structures. Some of them you'll recognize from the area. Um, so I encourage you to take a look at those and start noticing what kinds of roof systems tend to be associated with which kinds of styles, and. Um, I don't know about you, I found it interesting. Hopefully you do too. And I think that's everything.